We're continuing our study um, through the book of Samuel. When we first left off last time, uh, a couple weeks ago, we left with a woman dying after giving birth. And in her dying breath, she asked the question, where is the glory? And it seems as though the, you know, the, the, the whole disaster happened to God's people, to the Israelites in every way. And I shared this a couple of weeks ago how God's judgment came upon this house mightily in three steps. And the, the question that this dying woman's question is just, where is the glory? And that question actually kind of echoes in our minds. And I was writing, as I was working on this sermon several weeks ago, and the whole incident of what happened in Sutherland Springs in that First Baptist Church had just happened. And I can imagine the pastor, the survivors asking the question, where is the glory? Where is God? That's another way to put it. And Nancy was actually down in San Antonio with four of the kids this past week for the Bible Bee, and she brought to the church cards that many of you signed last week, and, um, and she brought them to the church, and she dropped off, and there are lots of flowers, Red Cross, and many churches were there, is great. And she sent me back many pictures, and there was a picture um, of Andrea, standing next to one of the chairs. What they have done is basically they remove all the pews. They have turned that church into a memorial and where every man, woman, or child was shot and killed, they put a chair with the rose and the name of the person behind it. And Andrew was standing there and I thought about how quite a contrast this is. My little Andrea sitting next to a, a man, a woman, or maybe a child has passed on to this world. And I think the question that must be for us is where is God? And especially where is God when it seems that wickedness reigns? And I think this chapter actually really speaks to us this is actually, in many ways, a very relevant chapter for us. It speaks to us, where is God when it hurts? God is actually not silent at all, but is working to bring about his glory. And what we're going to see here is that what God will do is that God's judgment, on first of all, on the pagan gods, and secondly, on the pagans themselves. So let's look at this passage here about God's, about God, God's judgment. Let me read to, to you. Let's start with verse 1. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from the Ebenezer to Ashdod. The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Let me just stop here real quickly. They had just brought this box, which is the Ark of the Covenant. If you guys want to know, the Ark of the Covenant in, under the Old Testament times represents the glory of God. God's very presence is supposed to be embodied in that box. And here it is. The Philistines had just destroyed God's people. And they took this box and they brought it as a trophy. In fact, you know, the, the actions of this, these verses is very fast. He says, they took, they brought, in verse 1. And then it's repeated again in verse 2. They took it, and they brought it, and they set it down as a trophy next to their God. What is very interesting about this 
It's in fact, if you go back to chapter 4, the same, the similar language of taking and bringing and taking and bringing is actually used of the Israelites themselves. Now, I have already explained two weeks ago that the way the Israelites treated the Ark of the Covenant was they treated it as though it was a good luck charm. Just because they had this box with them, that means that they were going to have a victory. It's called presumption. And God judged them for that. And here the pagans themselves are doing the very same thing. You know, it actually made me think here for a second. Sometimes the f- people of God treat the things of God very lightly. And sometimes they do so because they see we as people of God treating the things of God lightly. And this is a warning for myself as well. Am I cavalier in how I approach the things of God? Do I treat the God that we worship as holy, as deserving all of my reverence? And this is the question that, and then the pagans didn't do so because they, maybe they have seen the Israelites, God's people do so as well. So anyhow, they took this ark and they brought it and set it down next to their gods. Now, what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is they treated the Ark of the Covenant as though it was a trophy, as though their God won a great victory. And so they took the, they took the, um, the idols, they took their idols, and they actually took the Ark of the Covenant and set it next to the idol as though their God has won a victory. Well, we'll look at what happened next. We see that what happened when the people arose early in the next day is that their God has actually fallen face downward before the ark of the Lord. This is a beautiful picture. God actually knocked down their pagan God and proved that he's superior. Well, see, but pagans are not going to give up easily. So what they do is they, they just set up their God just like the day before and thinking that everything's going to be fine. Well, the next day what happened is that they woke up, bam, it happened again. But this time, the head and the hands of their pagan God were completely chopped off. Now, what's the significance of this? We get a picture of this 12 chapters from now when David takes on Goliath. We all know the story. He took the sling and he hit Goliath between the, between the eyes. And what happened? He fell down. Well, it's just that a stone sink into his forehead. Now, folks, if the stone sinks in his forehead, you think there's a chance he would stay alive? No. He's dead. He fell face down before David. But what did David do? He cut his head off anyways. What does that symbolize? It symbolized complete victory. Why did, when, so when God knocked down the head of Dagon, it means that he's completely destroyed. In fact, it's not only that his hands hits was cut off, but his hands were chopped off too. You know, in the ancient time, when they do body counts after victory, the way they do it is through head and hands. And this is the way that God is demonstrating that he has absolute, complete victory over Dagon. 
And so even though the people of God were mourning, God has indeed won a victory. Now you might be asking, what kind of God is Dagon? Dagon, in fact, is, he's a Philistine god. Um, and he's a Philistine god. That's actually, his name is actually derived from the word grain. And so many people think that he's, a, many people think he's actually God of the fertility. And he is, in fact, the father of Baal. Most of us, if we read our Bible, we know what Baal is. Right? And so Baal is actually the God, uh, God of fertility. And this is Dagon. This is Baal's father. So this is actually this big daddy God of fertility. But God won a victory over him. You know what's very interesting? Look at verse 4. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. It says only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. You know what it says literally in he Hebrew? He says his head and his hands were chopped off, but only Dagon was left to him. But what it says is that the stump is Dagon itself. Why is that significant? It's significant because what God is saying is all the idols we worship is nothing. It's literally stump itself. You know, our God is going to challenge every single idol out there. But you know what? You have idols, and I have idols. We might not have a statue, but it could be money, it could be pleasure, it could be career, it could be our family. It's anything that we set above God. And what's very in interesting is that, you know, if you look, talk to anybody, you know, if you talk to any one of us here, what will we say? Of course we're going to say we honor God above everything else. I would say that. But the thing that you need to ask yourself is what makes you jealous? Is it someone who has more money than you? Is it someone has better car? Someone has a more beautiful girlfriend or boyfriend? Is it someone has better phone than you? All these things that may make you jealous, those are the areas that you and I need to watch out for. You see, the thing that God hates more than anything else is rivals. And he's going to knock them down. And their rivals, we could say that I love God, there's no rivals. But it's just a, it's a test of the heart. What would you replace for the worship of God? Would you replace your work, making more money? This boy or this girl? Would you replace it for your wife? For things for your kids? All these are like rivals. Sure, we worship God. 
But we all have things in our own lives that we would easily substitute for God. And God says, you know what? I don't want any rivals. And you know what's really hard for us is that as hard as it is for the people of God is this. Idols are incredibly attractive, right? Who doesn't want power? Who doesn't want power that money can buy? Who doesn't want prestige and the pleasure that come with it? And that's why the ancient Paul people of Israel were often tempted by idols. Because beyond these idols, there's something else that people wanted. I believe Dagon, because he's a fertility god, probably a god that has to do with sex. And immorality. And these are all things that people want. But you know what's behind our idols? Ultimately, a stump. That's nothing. It cannot fulfill. Brothers and sisters, the reason why God gives us this passage is this. He wants to show that he's defeating the idols. But it's also a warning for us to not worship the idols. What does the psalm say? What does the psalm say about the idols? It says, He has eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear, mouth but cannot speak, hands but cannot move. And then what? Those who worship them become like them. You see, the idols that we have is actually eventually will turn us into it. Why do people who are into idols, let's say, pick an idol, who are into money, for example, will eventually depersonalize you? That's because your idol will drive you into doing things that you know is wrong. Or pleasure. Any type of addiction you can think of will eventually depersonalize you. Let's see this test. What does, what happens to the people of the Philistines? Let's look at God's judgment on the Philistines. It says, verse 6, the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and his territory. Let me just stop here for a second. This verse here says the hand of God was heavy. What was the last question in chapter 4? What was the dying word of this woman? Where's the glory, right? Where is the glory? The word for glory and the word for heavy are the same. And what is saying here in this passage right now is that God's hand, God's glory has not departed at all. God's glory is actually being demonstrated, in fact, in judgment. He had just cut off the pagan's hands. He had just cut off the pagan's head, the pagan idol's head. But all of a sudden here, God is demonstrating his judgment on the people. First forsaking them. You know, and people kind of argue all over the place, what is the nature of this plague? And what is this tumor? You know, why it's hard is, you know, this word for tumor can be translated into something else, another word. 
hemorrhoids. It has been used for hemorrhoids. So people were thinking, what is this disease? I think the best candidate is in flak, the bubonic plague, the black plague, the plague that swept over Europe and conservatively wiped out a third of the population. Why do I say this? Because the next chapter, when they bring a peace offering, the Philistines finally really recognize their mistake. They bring a peace offering to God. They brought, they made images of the tumors or hemorrhoids. Or they, um, and five of them for each city. And the other image they make is what? Mice. Mice. And these are actually, mice was actually the main ways that the bubonic plague was actually spread through all of Europe. I was reading a couple of accounts during um, the sermon preparation about the effect of bubonic plague. I don't have it with me, but there was their testimonies how the swellings, the fifth swellings would be the size of an apple. Someone could go to bed healthy at night and wake up dead. Next morning, well, they won't wake up. They will be dead the next morning. And it was talking about the people were delirious and panic was everywhere. In some places, whole towns were wiped out. And people had no idea how it spread. It was actually airborne bacteria that can spread everywhere. It was actually brought about by 12 ships docking in, I believe, Genoa, Italy. When the ship docked, um, the people realized that half the, half the sailors were dead. And the other half was deathly sick. So they quickly sent the ship out, leave the harbor. But it was too late already. For the next seven years, the, the whole plague decimated portions of Europe. With that little picture, you can see perhaps what the Philistines were going through. You know what's very, what's very interesting as well is that God's hand was heavy upon them and they were terrified and they were afflicted. And when he says that, when the man of Ashta saw how things were, they said the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? This is an echo of what happened back in chapter 4 when the Israelites suffered a great plague from God, great defeat, and they called the elders and said, What shall we do? The people here in this case says that let the ark of God be brought around to Gath. Now, what is Gath? Gath is a place where Goliath is from. And why was it brought to that land? We don't, we don't know. Maybe the, uh, there are five lords of the Philistines. Maybe he was the weakest one, so they brought it to the land. But notice this. They knew this plague was from God. But what did they end up doing? They just passed, played musical chair with the ark of God. Well, what happened when the ark of God went to Gath? It says what? After they brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against that city, causing great, very great panic, and he afflicted the man of the city, both young and old, so that tumor broke out among them. And so they, after that, they decided to send it to Ekron. They're playing musical chair. Now, you would think that if they knew that it was God, they wouldn't send it to their, keep sending it to their cities. 
they would in fact send it back. But how long was the ark of God actually with the Philistines? If you look at chapter 6, verse 1, it says it was with them for seven months. That's seven months of plague. Why couldn't they figure it out? I wonder, I think about that scripture passage. Those who worship the idols become like them. They knew it was God. But they didn't have the wisdom to return that. We look at this and we say, that's stupid. Anyone have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? If the Ark is ever here, don't open it. Don't open it. God's ark, God's powerful. But the people don't get it. That's what happens when false gods take over. You notice today, people recognize the problems we have in society. Poverty, racism, mass shooting, etc., etc. There are a lot of talks, but no one is able to arrive at an answer. Why? Because simply put, the answer is here. But nobody wants to recognize God's Word. Because nobody wants to recognize God's Word we are in our society, we're playing musical chairs too. Every issue you can talk about, we can talk about musical chairs. We can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This affects everywhere, healthcare, our justice system, our laws, every way. And it's not going to change until we recognize God. What's the solution for us? You know, here is a very, Colossian has a wonderful passage. It says that when Jesus crucified on the cross, one of the purpose he has was to disarm. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So when Jesus died on the cross, what he did was that he actually disarmed the rulers and authorities. He basically rendered them powerless. These things only have as much power as we give them. See, but in today's society, most people could not break free from their idols. You know those addictions on the rise? People being addicted to anything and everything that's on the rise? There's a reason for that. Well, one, we're made to worship. We are made to worship someone or something. And if we don't give them the power, um, if we give them the power Guilt overtake us. The solution is Christ, is to turn to Jesus with our idols. Now, this applies to people who are, if you're here today, you never received Christ as your Savior. That's for you. But it's also for us as people of God. You see, we're not that different from the Israelites. They want to turn to their pagan gods. 
and so do we. And the question at the end of the day is, who do you want to be your God? We have a God, the Lord Jesus Christ says, who says to me, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in the heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You need rest? Are you tired of being on the musical chair? The answer is to repent and turn to Jesus. My brother, dear brothers and sisters, God is not silent. He is at work right now. In Sutherland Springs, in Las Vegas, and here in Milwaukee. And he's going to right every wrong one day. Our job is to trust in him. Even at times when it's dark. You know, the ark of God looked like at first it was defeated. Jesus Christ looked like he was defeated on the cross. But Jesus death was the greatest victory and by the cross he not only demonstrated his love to us but he demonstrated judgment on the idols of this world turn to him I know we all have our idols but let us turn to him in repentance and seek his help let's pray Father God, we thank you. Thank you again for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. Father, we thank you, Lord. Ultimately, we know where the glory of God is and that you're working always to bring all things to your glory. Father, help us today to trust in you. Father, you know all of our hearts. You know the idols, idols that we have. the money we can't let go, the dad or mom we put on a pedestal, the children we adore, the career that we worship. Father God, we, we, we know the power of these in our lives. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you disarmed them on the cross and you will knock down all idols. Father, help us, give us a greater glimpse of your glory today and that we will worship you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.